Good morning, everyone. Um, we are going to um, officially pass uh, this meeting to our new chair, um, Dr. Grace Lee, uh, to officially open the ACIP meeting. And then um, I will go through our welcome slides. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. And um, welcome, everyone, to our 10th ACIP meeting for 2021 and our 20th meeting since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I wanted to just take a couple of minutes um, as I chair my first meeting today to again acknowledge our outgoing members, Dr. Hank Bernstein, Dr. Sharon Fry, and Dr. Jose Romero, our former chair of ACIP. Uh, we're really grateful for their service and dedication to our committee. Um, and I just want to take a moment to thank our current ACIP members for continuing to support our country on decisions about the use of vaccines. Um, and in particular for your willingness to make decisions in the face of uncertainty and constantly evolving data. Um, I am going to turn it over at this time to Dr. Cohn to um, uh, launch our uh, welcome slides, and then I will take roll after that. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, COVID August 13th virtual ACIP meeting. Um, copies of the slides that are being presented today are available on the ACIP website and available through a share link file for ACIP voting liaison and ex officio meetings. Next slide. These are the same notes. I believe you've probably seen these now almost 20 times um, about how to work the Zoom call. Uh, so um, virtually raise your hand. Um, and during the discussion, Dr. Lee will take questions first from the voting ACIP members and then from ex officio members and liaison representatives. Uh, the videos will be disabled um, until, a, uh, until the vote, and then the ACIP voting members will turn on their video during the vote. Next slide. ACIP um, is at its heart a public body and engagement with the public and transparency in our processes is vital to our committee's work. For this meeting, we'll be holding a public comment period prior to the vote um, at about 12, 15, 12, 30 this afternoon. Um, this will be the oral public comment period. In addition, there is a docket um, for written public comment available at uh, www.regulations.gov. The docket ID for this meeting is CDC-2021-0084. Um, the ACIP members uh, have received this uh, meeting docket and are reviewing public comments. Next slide. Members of the ACIP agree to forego participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. Um, there are, we have issued some limited conflicts of interest waivers for members of ACIP who conduct clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards. Um, in this situation, ACIP members will be asked to, uh, are prohibited from participating in committee votes on issues related to those vaccines. In addition, they are prohibited from voting on any other um, uh, vote that uh, involves a company, um, the company that uh, the, the clinical trial of DSMB board is, is part of. Next slide. I want to alert you to some upcoming uh, ACIP meetings. The first is scheduled at this time for August 24th, 2021. This will be um, a follow-up meeting to this meeting and uh, will be uh, related to COVID-19 vaccines only. We are having an additional meeting uh, to catch up on our non-COVID related activities. Uh, the FRN should be available for this meeting soon. Um, this will be September 29th and 30th um, of, this, um, of, of this year. So please be on the lookout for the agenda for that meeting. In addition, we will be having our uh, regularly scheduled October 20th to 21st meeting um, on non-COVID vaccine related um, issues. Um, there will always and likely be additional COVID vaccine meetings, uh, so please continue to check the ACIP website. We do try to update the ACIP website as soon as possible. Next slide. Um, before Dr. Lee takes role, I do just want to make um, a couple of, uh, of comments about uh, the committee today. 
We have, um, as Dr. Lee mentioned, we have said goodbye to uh, three of our outgoing members. Uh, we have new members that have been uh, approved and um, have accepted, uh, but we continue to uh, we're continuing to uh, onboard them to to be officially members and to be able to participate in these meetings. They're listening on the line today, um, but we um, welcome them and will announce them um, as soon as they are on board. So we will have uh, fewer ACIP me me members than typical uh, uh, at this meeting, um, but we still have uh, well above our quorum. Uh, so we are uh, we our quorum for this committee is eight, and we uh, should have eleven members participating today. So, Dr. Lee, um, I will hand it over to you to start taking uh, roll. And uh, remember, when the ACIP members uh, announce themselves, please announce if you have any conflicts of interest. Dr. Lee, I uh, think. Yep. Thank you. Um, we are uh, excited uh, to have the opportunity at the next meeting, hopefully, to welcome our new ACIP members, as Dr. Cohn mentioned. And I also just, you know, wanted to take a quick moment to thank our ACIP secretariat, uh, Drs. Amanda Cohn, Jessica McNeil, and Stephanie Thomas for all their work in setting us up for this meeting today and just making sure that things run smoothly for all of ACIP. Um, so I'll now take roll call, starting with the ACIP members and then the ex officio members and liaisons. For the ACIP members, I'm going to ask that you state your name, your affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts of interest. Um, and then for the ex officio and liaisons, I'll just announce your organization name and then please indicate if you're present and your first and last name. So we will start with Dr. Alt. My name is Kevin Alt and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist at the University of Kansas in Kansas City, Kansas, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you. Ms. Lynn Bata. Good morning. This is Lynn Bata. I am a public health nurse with the Minnesota Department of Health, providing clinical consultation to the immunization program, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chen? Wilbur Chen, uh, adult infectious disease physician, uh, professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Um, good morning, um, Matt Daly, Senior Investigator, Institute for Health Research, Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, Associate Professor, Pediatrics, University of Colorado School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? Good morning. Camille Cotton. I am the Clinical Director of Transplant and Immunocompromised Host Infectious Disease at Massachusetts General Hospital and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Long? Good morning, Sarah Long. I'm a pediatric infectious disease uh, doctor and professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, and I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Long. Ms. McNally? Good morning. Veronica McNally, president of the Brainy Strong Foundation, located in Michigan, and I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Peeling. Good morning, this is Kathy Paling. I'm a general pediatrician and professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine. I have no conflict. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Sanchez um, is going to be late to this meeting. He will be, uh, he'll announce you. himself when he joins. Thank you. Uh, just uh, please let me know when he is able to join, and we'll call on him then. Uh, Dr. Talbot? Good morning. I'm Kip Talbot. I'm an associate professor of medicine. I'm an adult infectious disease physician, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. And I believe I'm the last one on the list. So uh, Grace Lee, associate CMO at Stanford Children's Health, professor of pediatrics and infectious diseases at um, Stanford University School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts. Um, with that, we will move on to our ex officio members and liaisons. And again, I'll state the name of the organization. If you could please indicate if you're present and your first and last name. Uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good morning, this is Melinda Horton. Thank you. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Good morning. This is Mary Beth Hans. Thank you. Food and Drug Administration. 
Uh, good morning. This is uh, Doran Fink, and I'm also pleased to announce that Peter Marks, uh, Director of Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, is uh, here representing FDA as well. Thank you, Dr. Fink and Dr. Marks. Um, Health Resources and Service Administration. Good morning. This is Mary Rubin. Thank you. Indian Health Service. Good morning. Thomas Weiser for Indian Health Service. Great. Um, National Institutes of Health. Good morning, John Bible, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIH. Thank you. Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Good morning. This is David Kim. Good morning. Um, we'll move on to our liaison representatives, the American Academy of Family Physicians. Good morning, Pamela Rockwell, um, Associate Professor, of Family Medicine, University of Michigan Medical School, AAFP. Thank you. American Academy of Pediatrics. Good morning. Uh, Bonnie Maldonado, Professor of Global Health and Infectious Diseases, Stanford University, and Chair of the Committee on Infectious Diseases for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you. And do we have our colleague on from the American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book today? Uh, yes, David Kimberlin, editor of the AAP Red Book. Thank you. Um, American Academy of Physician Assistants. Good morning, Marie-Michelle Léger, Director of Clinical Education, American Academy of PAs. Thank you. American College Health Association. Good morning, Sharon McMullen, Cornell University, co-chair of ACHA's Vaccine Preventable Diseases Committee. Thank you. American College of Nurse Midwives. Present, Pamela Meharry. Thank you. Um, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. And this is Linda Eckert, and I'm uh, with uh, ACOG. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, American College of Physicians. Good morning, Jason Goldman, General Internal Medicine in Carl Springs, Florida, Affiliate Associate Professor at Florida Atlantic University, representing the American College of Physicians. Pleasure to be here, and congratulations on your chairmanship. Thank you. American Geriatric Society. Educator for AGS. Uh, thank you. Americans Health Insurance Plans. And this is Bob Gluckman, uh, Chief Medical Officer, Providence Health Plans, Portland, Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. American Immunization Registry Association. Good morning. Rebecca Coyle is here representing ARA. Perfect. Thank you. American Medical Association. Sandra Freyhofer, uh, practicing general internist in Atlanta, adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory, representing the American Medical Association. Thank you. American Nurses Association. Good morning, Chad Riddle, representing the ANA. Thank you. American Osteopathic Association. Dan Grau, good morning to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. American Pharmacists Association. Good morning. This is Steve Foster. Thank you. Association of Immunization Managers. Hi, this is Molly Howell, Immunization Director for the North Dakota Department of Health, representing AIM. Thank you. Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. This is Paul McKinney, University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. Thank you. Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Good morning, Dr. Lee. This is Neeraj Shah. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and the president of ASTA. Thanks, Dr. Shah. Um, Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Good morning. Phyllis Arthur representing Bio. Good morning. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Christine Hahn, present. Thank you. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Good morning, Shelley Gates. Good morning. Uh, Infectious Diseases Society of America. Carol Baker. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, International Society for Travel Medicine. Good morning, Elizabeth Barnett for the ISTM. Thank you. National Association of County and City Health Officials. Good morning. This is Matt Zahn representing NHO. Thank you. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Good morning, Patsy Stinchfield, representing NAPNAP. Thank you. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Okay. 
National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. I can see you. <laughs> oh, now I'm unmuted. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Grace. Uh, <clears throat> this is Bill Schaffner. I'm a professor of preventive medicine and infectious diseases at Vanderbilt and medical director of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Thank you. Thank you. National Medical Association. Um, Virginia Kane is substituting for uh, Dr. Whitley Williams. Uh, are you are you there, Ms. Kane, Dr. Kane? She's not here quite yet. We can move on, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Good morning, Dr. Lee. Uh, Sean O'Leary, representing the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Thank you. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning, Corey Robertson, present. Good morning, Society of uh, for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Good morning, it's Amy Middleman representing SAM. Good morning, and Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Good morning, this is Marcy Dries, Chief Infection Prevention Officer at Christiana Care, representing Shea. Thank you, um, and with that, um, I'll, uh, any any individuals or organizations that I've missed, Dr. Cohn. Uh, yes, um, a National Medical Association, Dr. Virginia Cade. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Terrific. Okay, and with that, um, I think we can move on to the next section of the agenda. Um, oh, actually, before we start, um, just a few announcements. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dr. Cohn, you can jump in if I get the order a little bit off today, but uh, during today's meeting, I'm going to invite individuals to contribute to the discussion. Um, uh, please raise your hands electronically, as mentioned, and I'm going to call on ACIP members first, followed by our ex officio members and liaisons. Uh, we are going to try a, a new approach that if you wish to respond to a particular comment or question um, uh, for the ACIP members, please indicate you'd like to respond via the thumbs up button, and I will try and call on you to respond to the issue being discussed. Um, we're always evolving and uh, continually improving. So, uh, but before we get started, I believe um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Cohen and our colleagues from the FDA um, to make a statement perhaps about um, uh, the ongoing uh, decisions that were made recently. Dr. Finker, Dr. Marks, do y'all wanna um, provide us with the announcement of the EUA that was approved last night? Sure. This is this is Peter Marks. I can I can do that if you'd like. Um, uh, so so thanks very much. So uh, I, as as everyone's aware, the immunocompromised are a heterogeneous group uh, in their ability to respond to the available COVID nineteen vaccines. Um, some have a relatively modest uh, immune repairment. Others uh, may either not respond or respond poorly. Uh, to uh, the existing COVID-19 vaccines. Those are individuals such as those who um, have received solid organ transplants um, or who are on other medications that are typically used uh, for solid organ transplants. Um, and after uh, reviewing recent studies, uh, including two different studies, one for uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the other uh, for uh, the Moderna vaccine, both of which have now uh, appeared in letter format in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, we uh, decided to uh, amend the emergency use authorization um, uh, to allow for a third dose of COVID-19 vaccine to be administered um, uh, to uh, individuals uh, at least uh, 12 years of age for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine or 18 years of age for the Moderna vaccine who had undergone solid organ transplantation or who were diagnosed with conditions that are considered to have an equivalent level of immunocompromise. We've caveated that with the fact that the administration of these third doses appears to be only moderately effective in increasing antibody titers. Uh, so patients should be counseled to maintain physical precautions to help prevent COVID-19 and close contacts of immunocompromised persons should be vaccinated as appropriate for their health status. Um, so um, uh, we will continue to evaluate data as it becomes available. Um, but for now, um, uh, we uh, have done this for uh, these two uh, uh, vaccines. Over. Thank you, Dr. Marks. We really appreciate you setting the context for today's meeting. <laughs> so that's really helpful. 
All right. Um, in today's first COVID-19 session, we will have Dr. Matt Daly provide an introduction. Dr. Kathleen Dooling will present on the evidence to recommendations framework on additional doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. And Dr. Neela Goswami will present on clinical considerations for use of additional doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. And with that, I, I think I can turn it over to Dr. Daly for the introduction. Um, good morning. Um, so I'll provide a few uh, introductory slides on behalf of the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup. Next slide, please. Um, this is a graph that we've um, seen and presented at several prior meetings. Um, the y-axis I'll highlight is that cases, daily cases in hundreds of thousands. Um, with time on the x-axis. And as you can see, since July 1st, there's been a 700% uh, increase in the seven-day moving average for COVID-19 cases in the United States. Next slide, please. Um, so to update the uh, ACIP on COVID-19 uh, vaccines workgroup activities for the last two months, um, we've been meeting um, at least weekly. Um, and the topics covered at those meetings have included the following. We have uh, reviewed vaccines uh, with respect to SARS-CoV-2 variants. We have reviewed and discussed uh, updates on myocarditis following vaccination. Uh, in addition, we reviewed in detail the evidence to recommendations framework for additional doses of mRNA vaccines for immunocompromised individuals. And we'll hear more about that today. Um, we have also discussed a number of clinical considerations related to these individuals, as well as other issues. And additionally, we've talked about considerations for booster doses of COVID-19 vaccines um, in the broader, more general population. Next slide, please. So for today's ACIP meeting, um, we will specifically discuss additional doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines as part of a primary ser series in immunocompromised individuals. And then in addition, we will also discuss considerations for booster doses of COVID-19 vaccines in the general population. Next slide, please. So here's the detailed agenda. <clears throat> as Dr. Lee mentioned, we will start with a presentation by Dr. Kathleen Dooling, which is going to present the, uh, she is going to present the evidence to recommendations framework, additional doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines as part of a primary series for immunocompromised individuals or people. Um, she'll be followed by a presentation by Dr. Neela Goswami, um, who will discuss clinical considerations for use of additional doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines as part of a primary vaccination series for immunocompromised compromised people. After Dr. Goswani's presentation, we'll have a public comment, um, after which we will have a vote. And then after the vote, we'll have two additional um, presentations, the first by Dr. Heather Scobie, which will be an update on emerging SARS-CoV-2 variants and COVID-19 vaccines, um, followed by Dr. Sarah Oliver, who will present on considerations for booster doses of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, followed by a ACIP discussion. Next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to thank all of the COVID-19 vaccines workgroup members, um, ACIP members, ex officio members, liaisons, and consultants, and in particular, the CDC leads, Dr. Sarah Oliver and Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Next slide, please. As well as um, a number of uh, um, uh, CDC participants who've made, uh, worked tremendously hard and made outstanding contributions to the entire process. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I'll turn this back to you, Dr. Lee. Thanks, Dr. Daly. Um, and with that, I think we'll proceed to Dr. Kathleen Dooling to discuss the evidence to recommendations framework. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, the topic for this presentation will be an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine following a primary series in immunocompromised people. Next slide. 
Before getting into the evidence to recommendation framework, I'd like to reference the regulatory allowance upon which we're proceeding today, which was uh, introduced by Dr. Marks. Last night, August 12th, the FDA authorized an additional vaccine dose for certain immunocompromised individuals. It should be noted that the amendment only applies to immunocompromised people. Other fully vaccinated individuals do not need an additional dose right now. The amendment applies to Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine ages 12 and older and Moderna COVID-19 vaccine ages 18 and older. Data are insufficient um, for the EUA amendment for an additional dose, sorry, uh, due to insufficient data, the EUA amendment for an additional dose does not apply to Janssen COVID-19 vaccine or individuals who received Janssen COVID-19 as a primary series. CDC and FDA are actively engaged to ensure that immunocompromised recipients of Janssen COVID-19 vaccine have optimal vaccine protection. Next slide. So as sanctioned by the ACIP, the evidence, uh, next slide. The evidence to recommendation framework allows us uh, to describe the evidence to inform ACIP recommendations in a transparent manner. Next slide. So this is our policy question for today. Should ACIP recommend vaccination with an additional dose of uh, either Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, uh, otherwise known as mRNA vaccines, following a primary series in immunocompromised people under an emergency use authorization? Next slide. This discussion will be focused on the immunocompromised population, and by that we mean people with medical conditions or people receiving treatments that are associated with moderate to severe immune compromise. So that includes uh, active or recent treatment for a solid tumor or hematologic malignancy, receipt of solid organ or a re recent hematopoietic stem cell transplants, severe primary immunodeficiency, advanced or untreated HIV infection, active treatment with high-dose corticosteroids, alkylating agents, metabolites, tumor necrosis uh, blockers, or, and other biologic agents that are immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory. And finally, uh, there are chronic medical conditions such as asplenia and chronic renal disease uh, that may be associated with varying degrees of immune deficit. Next slide. So the um, intervention that we are focused on is an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. An additional dose of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine or Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, uh, it, both in people 18 years of age and older, after an additional initial two-dose primary series of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people. Please note that the work group interpretations that follow were based on consideration of people 18 years of age and older for both vaccines. However, the FDA emergency use authorization amendment provides allowance for the use of, uh, a, of an additional dose of Pfizer uh, vaccine in adolescents 12 to 17 years old. We look forward to ACIP discussion on the optimal age range. Next slide. Sorry, if you can go back a slide. I advanced too quickly. So attempts uh, should be made to match the additional dose type uh, of the mRNA primary series. However, if that is not feasible, a heterologous additional dose is permitted. The additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine should be administered at least 28 days after completion of the primary mRNA COVID-19 vaccine series. Next slide. So before proceeding with the ETR, I'd like to reiterate that any recommendation for an additional dose would not supplant the importance of infection prevention measures. Immunocompromised people should continue to wear a mask, stay six feet apart from others they don't live with, and avoid crowds and poorly ventilated indoor spaces until advised otherwise by their healthcare provider. And importantly, close contacts of immunocompromised people should str are strongly encouraged to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Next slide. The evidence to recommendation framework domains and central questions are listed here. As we move through each domain, next slide, 
The public health problem uh, refers to COVID-19 among immunocompromised people, and the intervention refers to an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people who have already received a primary series of an mRNA COVID vaccine. Next slide. First, a description of the public health problem. Next slide. COVID-19 cases have been increasing since early July. As of August 9th, there have been over 35 million COVID-19 cases reported to CDC, with the most recent seven-day averages of over 100,000 cases per day. Next slide. Hospitalization rates, too, have been increasing since early July. Next slide. Deaths have also been increasing. The current seven-day moving average is over 600 deaths per day from COVID-19. Next slide. According to one national survey, immunocompromised people comprise approximately 2.7% of the U.S. adult population, or approximately 7 million adults. Immunocompromised people are more likely to get severely ill from COVID-19. They are at higher risk uh, for prolonged SARS-CoV-2 infection and shedding and viral evolution uh, during the infection and treatment, uh, particularly amongst hospitalized patients. They have a lower antibody neutralization titers to SARS-CoV-2 variants compared to non-immunocompromised people, and they are more likely to transmit SARS-CoV-2 to household contacts. Next slide. Immunocompromised people are more likely to have breakthrough infection. In small studies of hospitalized breakthrough cases, 40 to 44 uh, percent were deemed to be immunocompromised. Several observational studies have shown lower vaccine effectiveness, with, a VE, with VE estimates ranging from 59 to 72 percent among immunocompromised versus 90 to 94 percent among non-immunocompromised people after two doses of mRNA vaccine. Next slide. This graph is one uh, we've presented before, and it's been updated since, but it shows the percentage of antibody response after two mRNA vaccine doses by different types of immunocompromising condition. Studies among people with cancer are shown in blue, uh, with hematologic cancers shown in darker blue. Uh, the proportion with antibody response ranged from 45% to 95%, with lower responses seen among uh, people with hematologic cancers. Studies of people on hemodialysis are shown in green and ranged from 71% to 98% response following two doses. Studies of people with solid organ transplant had the largest deficits in antibody response, ranging from 0 to 79%. Studies of people with, uh, treated for autoimmune or inflammatory disorders ranged from 40% to 94% response to an MRA in a primary series. By comparison, healthy controls, uh, where they were included in these studies, ranged from 95 to 100% of uh, vaccine response. Almost all studies that assessed response after the first and second doses demonstrated a less robust response after only one dose. Next slide. Several countries, including France, UK, Israel, and Germany, are considering or have announced plans for the use of an additional dose in immunocompromised people. Next slide. Based on review of this data, the work group felt that yes, COVID disease among immunocompromised people is of public health importance. Next slide. Moving on to benefits and harms. Next slide. We will aim to answer this question. Uh, how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects? Next slide. And how substantial are the anticipated undesirable effects? Next slide. And ultimately, if the undesirable effects outweigh, if the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects. Next slide. Earlier this week, the first randomized trial of third dose of mRNA vaccine in transplant recipients was published. This study randomized 120 vaccinated people to either a third dose of Moderna vaccine or placebo. 
The primary outcome was a receptor binding domain antibody level of at least 100 units per mil at one month post-dose 3. As you can see from the figures panels A and B, antibodies were higher in recipients of the third dose of Moderna vaccine, with 55% of the vaccine group achieving the endpoint versus only 18% of the placebo group. Encouraging improvements in immune response were also observed for neutralizing antibodies and T cell function. Next slide. This slide shows five observational studies, two in recipients of solid organ transplants and three in patients on hemodialysis. The studies looked at the seropositivity after a second dose of mRNA, which ranged from 20 to 89 percent, and then a third dose of mRNA was administered. Among those who had no detectable antibody response to the initial mRNA vaccine primary series, 33 to 50% developed an antibody response to a third dose. Next slide. In the Kumar et al. Studied, uh, study of solid organ transplant patients, uh, shown on the previous slide, the proportion of the group who were seropositive increased after each dose. 40% post-dose 2, and 68% one month post-dose 3. In addition, as you can see in panel B, the average antibody titer increased after each dose. So even those who were already seropositive increased, experienced increases in their antibody levels. In this study of 99 transplant patients, no serious adverse events were reported after administration of the third dose, and no acute rejection episodes occurred. Next slide. Here we highlight the EPSI et al. study, which showed the reactogenicity of a third mRNA vaccine in a cohort of patients on hemodialysis. No patients developed side effects that required hospitalization. Symptoms reported were consistent with the previous doses, and the intensity of the symptoms was mostly mild in yellow or moderate in orange, as you can see. Next slide. To summarize the available evidence regarding possible benefits, Emerging experimental and observational data in adults suggests that an additional mRNA COVID vaccine in immunocompromised people enhances antibody response and increases the proportion who respond to COVID-19 vaccine. No efficacy or effectiveness studies of COVID-19 prevention following a third dose exist. Um, with respect to potential harms, in small studies of an additional dose of mRNA vaccine, no serious adverse events were observed, and reactogenicity of a third dose of mRNA was similar to prior doses. It should be noted that mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are associated with rare but, some, but serious adverse events, including anaphylaxis, as well as myocarditis and pericarditis in young adults. The impact of immunocompromising conditions on these rare events is unknown. There are no safety studies uh, published on additional mRNA doses in immunocompromised adolescents. Next slide. The work group felt that the desirable anticipated effects were large. Next slide. And the undesirable anticipated effects were minimal. Next slide. And that the balance favored the intervention, the use of an additional dose of mRNA COVID vaccine in immunocompromised people. Next slide. Moving on to values and acceptability. Next. Here we will try to address the tar how the target population feels about the balance of desirable and undesirable effects. Next. And uh, is there variability in how people value the outcomes? Next. And is an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines acceptable to stakeholders? Next slide. First, uh, let's look at the use of additional doses of COVID-19 vaccines in the general U.S. population, a practice that is not currently recommended by ACIP. Approximately 140 million individuals completed a two-dose primary series of either Moderna or Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Approximately 1.14 million people, that's less than 1%, received one or more additional COVID-19 vaccine doses. 
Approximately 12 million individuals received a one-dose primary series of Janssen COVID-19 vaccine, and a little over 90,000 of them, also constituting about 1% of this uh, population, received one or more additional doses of COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide, please. Now, to focus in on the immunocompromised population that we're considering here today, we can look to a large study that was conducted among individuals with cancer, autoimmune disease, and other conditions early in the COVID vaccine rollout. Uh, at that time, 81% were already uh, vaccinated or intended to become vaccinated. 19% either said that they were unsure, probably wouldn't, or definitely wouldn't receive a COVID-19 vaccine. This was a higher intent to vaccinate than the general adult population. Factors associated with hesitancy uh, among the recipients were younger age, female gender, uh, Black, Pacific Island, or Native American race or ethnicity, and less formal education, anti-vaccine sentiment, and distrust of the media. Next slide. In terms of stated reasons for vaccine refusal among immunocompromised people are many and varied, but across studies, concerns about safety and possible side effects, as well as the discomfort or distrust of vaccines were common. Next slide. Professional bodies strongly support COVID-19 vaccination and an additional use of an additional dose in immunocompromised uh, populations. In the many letters received from professional associations, whom are listed on this slide, two main points emerged. They encouraged study, uh, study of the safety and effectiveness and efficacy of an additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people, and they supported swift action on the part of ACIP to recommend use of an additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people. Please note that the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society and Children's Oncology Group supported use of an additional dose in immunocompromised adolescents. Next slide. Patient advocacy bodies also express strong support of COVID-19 vaccination and study of an additional dose. Specifically, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society supports providing access uh, to doses of COVID-19 vaccine for supplemental vaccination in immunocompromised patients and urge that these patients have the opportunity to be among the first to receive these additional doses. Next slide. In summary, the available evidence for values is that overall, initial intent to vaccinate is high among immunocompromised populations. Concerns about safety and possible side effects are the main reasons for vaccine hesitancy. Younger age, female gender, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, and less formal education are factors associated with vaccine hesitancy. Strong support for an additional dose was expressed by immunocompromised patients via written and oral comment to ACIP meeting uh, on July 22, 2021. Next slide. With regard to acceptability, professionals who provide health care to immunocompromised people recognize that their patients are at high risk for severe outcomes from COVID-19 and strongly support a recommendation for an additional dose of COVID vaccine. Societies that advocate for access to the best quality care for patients with immunocompromising conditions support access to an additional dose of COVID-19 uh, vaccine to increase the chances of vaccine protection. Next slide. The work group concluded that the target group felt the desirable effects were large compared to the undesirable effects. Next slide. And that there was probably not important uncertainty or variability. Next slide. The work group felt that yes, an additional dose of mRNA COVID vaccine for immunocompromised people was acceptable to key stakeholders. Next slide. Moving on to feasibility. Next slide. The question we're trying to answer here is, is an additional dose of mRNA COVID vaccine feasible to implement among immunocompromised people? Next slide. In general, 
There are high levels of interaction between immunocompromised populations and and the healthcare system, um, which provide opportunities for an additional dose following the primary series. mRNA COVID-19 vaccine supply in the U.S. is sufficient to make an additional dose for immunocompromised people feasible. Testing for antibodies following vaccination is not recommended, thus reducing the complexity of a recommendation for an additional dose. Next slide. The work group felt that yes, an additional dose of mRNA vaccine is feasible to implement among immunocompromised people. Next slide. Moving on to resource use. Next slide. In addressing if an additional dose of mRNA vaccine given to immunocompromised people is a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. Next slide. The U.S. government has purchased 600 million doses of mRNA vaccines. Vaccine is available at no cost to the recipient. No studies have evaluated cost effectiveness uh, regarding the use of COVID-19 vaccines among immunocompromised, uh, nor a third dose. Immunocompromised patients experience high medical costs at baseline and are at high risk of hospitalization. The cost of an additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine is small relative to these costs. Next slide. It should be noted that the work group um, has previously concluded that the cost effectiveness may not be the primary driver for decision making during a pandemic and uh, for vaccines under use, uh, under an emergency use authorization. Next slide. The work group felt that yes, an additional dose of mRNA vaccine given to immunocompromised people is a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. Next slide. And finally, equity. Next slide. So the question we're attempting to answer here is what would be the impact of an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine given to immunocompromised people on health equity? Next slide. Um, so to, to, to review, health equity is when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of a social position or other socially determined circumstances. There are a number of immunocompromised groups in the United States who could be disadvantaged with respect to an additional mRNA COVID uh, vaccine dose. Those people include uh, those who may experience limited access to vaccines because of their place of residence or socioeconomic status or personal characteristics, or those who belong to a group for whom vaccine hesitancy is high. In addition, for the time being, those who receive Janssen COVID vaccine will not be eligible for an additional dose of mRNA vaccine. Next slide. In the general U.S. population, great strides have been made towards equitable uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, but there is still room for improvement. We may see similar patterns of uptake uh, among immunocompromised people. Next slide. Equitable application of this intervention can be bolstered by a multi-pronged approach to ensure access. Making sure mRNA vaccines are available at primary care providers, specialist clinics serving immunocompromised patients, as well as uh, FQHCs, rural health clinics, and community health centers, as well as hospitals and pharmacies. Next slide. The work group felt that an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine given to immunocompromised people would probably have no impact on health equity. Next slide. So in summary, next slide. This slide highlights all the workgroup judgments for each of the ETR domains. The workgroup concluded that a COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people is an important, sorry, uh, COVID-19 disease in immunocompromised people is an important public health problem. The anticipated desirable effects of an additional dose of mRNA vaccine are large and undesirable effects expected to be minimal, favoring the intervention. The certainty of the evidence was not formally graded. The work group felt that the target population valued the intervention and that the intervention was acceptable to stakeholders, feasible to implement, and a reasonable use of resources. The work group thought an additional dose of mRNA vaccine for immunocompromised people would probably not impact health equity. Next slide. 
Overall, most workgroup members felt that the desirable consequences clearly outweighed undesirable consequences in most settings. Next slide. After reviewing the totality of information presented in the evidence to recommendation framework, the workgroup discussed the type of recommendation to propose to ACIP. The options are, we do not recommend the intervention, we recommend the intervention for individuals based on cleared, shared clinical decision-making, or we recommend the intervention. Most workgroup members supported, we recommend the intervention. Next slide. So to start the discussion today, we'd like to leave ACIP members with the following questions. Uh, concerning the intervention, does ACIP support the intervention of an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine following a primary series in immunocompromised people? And second, the population. Balancing potential benefits and harm, potential harms, what are, is the optimal lower age threshold for the additional dose intervention in immunocompromised people? Uh, before I turn it over to uh, the chair, next slide, please. I'd like to thank all of the people who have worked tirelessly to uh, pull this presentation together and without whom uh, it would uh, not be possible. So let's uh, go back to the previous slide. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, Dr. Duling, for that um, outstanding presentation. Uh, before we take questions, and I appreciate um, our colleagues are putting their hands up in the chat, I just want to um, ask Dr. Sanchez, who's been able to join us, if he could state his name, affiliation, and any conflicts of interest. Thank you, Grace. This is uh, Pablo Sanchez, um, uh, Professor of Pediatrics in Neonatology and Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Nationwide Children's. Hospital, um, the Ohio State University in Columbus. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, terrific. Thank you so much. And um, I, I am going to now call on our ACIP members. Um, and again, I'll just remind folks if there is a response to an item on the table, please try and indicate so. Um, we'll start with Dr. Alt. I had a question for Dr. Oliver about the background information. On slide 15, I know there are 63 studies there. On slide 15, is there any information about HIV mixed into those studies, any of those columns? As is really, I'm asking about the HIV positive population. Hello, uh, this is Dr. Dooling. Um, uh, are you referring to uh, the slide 17, which uh, has various immunocompromising conditions and uh, their overall seropositivity following a primary series? Yes, I am. When I printed them out yesterday, that was slide 15. So you're <laughs> Um, so, uh, so no, there wasn't sufficient uh, information specifically in HIV positive populations to um, to present uh, the data as a body of evidence here. Um, uh, over. Thank you, um, Dr. Paling. Hi, Dr. Dooling. First of all, thank you for a very thoughtful and precise, uh, precise conversation about this um, important topic and to all the members of the work group. Um, I wanted to say, um, wanted to answer your question and say, yes, I agree with the supporting of the information that the benefits are tremendous and um, the um, potential negative impacts are minimal, and so I agree um, that we should recommend that. The second part, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on children um, and address that answer. And so my thought is that children 12 to 17 years of age have moderate and severe immunocompromising conditions that reflect the full spectrum um, that occur in um, adults. In addition, leukemia and lymphoma are common cancers in children. And the mechanism creating the immunocompromising conditions are similar for both children and adults. And when we looked at the response to the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, which is the only one with an EUA for children, it was similar for children and uh, young adults. Um, given that we have, um, the data suggests that um, breakthrough disease um, 
40 to 44 percent of that occurs among immunocompromising um, conditions. I think it's very important that children 12 to 17 years have access to additional dose. Um, yeah, I think it's also very important that it's an official recommendation because I do, um, having noted that some people received vaccine without um, an additional EUA, I do think it's important for health equity. We also have to recognize that some of these children will be in schools, and so this becomes of paramount importance. Um, and I also want to appreciate that the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society and the Children's Oncology Group support including children 12 to 17 years of age with immunocompromising conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move to Dr. Chen. Uh, thank you, Grace. Um, I think I have two comment questions. One is regarding the intervention. And I agree that the, uh, the data supports the intervention, but I do have a question comment about the way that it's worded because, and again, it may be limited by the FDA's EUA amendment, which is I would endorse a statement where we were to allow an additional dose of an mRNA-based vaccine in any primary series um, that was completed. And I'm not sure if there is going to be more precise language which would state something to the effect of only if they had received a primary series around an mRNA vaccine. So again, uh, I, I guess I'm going back to a consequence of uh, people who received the J&J &J vaccine as their primary series. And again, um, scientifically, I think that there should be data that supports that a booster dose after a primary series should be very valuable for protection. Thanks, Dr. So I guess my, uh, my second comment is about population. So um, I, I wonder if the data is suggesting that for at least say, for example, the hemodialysis patients who, who largely do respond well to vaccination, but still do have a significant detectable uh, decrement in vaccine efficacy as a population. This also represents a population that frequently has to contact medical facilities three times a week, typically for hemodialysis, and need to be uh, you know, in a, uh, for a long duration of immobility within an indoor space you know, for their three to four hour session for a dialysis. So uh, again, these people may be susceptible to uh, localized outbreaks. There are also people who, who are probably more susceptible to having more severe disease. So um, I'm just looking at this and making sure that uh, I would like to have the recommendation allow for a population a little bit uh, more broad than what the EUA suggests. And, and I'm, reading the EUA language as, as saying something to the effect of, you know, solid organ transplant level immune suppression. But then our data that we just reviewed suggests that hemodialysis doesn't approach that level. So I guess it's a matter of interpretation of what we think <laughs> approaches the level of uh, solid organ transplant immunosuppression. So I'll stop there. Dr. Chen, oh, this you, Dr. is, Chen. oh, this is Dr. Cohn. I can jump in. Um, so to answer the second question, there is a follow-up presentation after this one where we will specifically outline uh, what we are considering um, in, in the clinical considerations document, how we're, we're uh, providing guidance to clinicians about uh, who would be considered similarly immunocompromised. So I would hold your question till that presentation. Um, with regards to the first question, um, you know, we um, understand that individuals who are immunocompromised who received J&J &J vaccine are not included in this EUA. Um, we, there, as, as Dr. Marx indicated at the beginning, uh, there were not data to support inclusion of that population in the EUA, and 
uh, we uh, need to keep our uh, recommendation boundaries within the considerations of use um, in order to um, ensure that uh, uh, this, these vaccines are being implemented appropriately under the EUA. However, we absolutely understand um, that this is an important issue that needs to be addressed. We're working to address that population. And I also just want to um, remind everyone that given the way that these vaccines rolled out and when this population was um, was eligible for vaccination, J&J &J vaccines um, have, have compromised um, many, many fewer doses overall. The only 12 million dose people have been vaccinated um, compared to 149 million with the mRNA vaccines. And of those 12 million, there's, it's likely to be a very small number of those uh, would fall into this severely immunocompromised um, group, uh, just given the timing of uh, when that vaccine was available. So um, I just want to acknowledge that that is absolutely um, something we are working on. But at this meeting, we're, we, we need to stay within the boundaries of the EUA. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Um, Dr. Marks, do you have any additional comments or any other uh, uh, suggestions? <laughs> so, so thanks very much. I, I, think, uh, I think Dr. Cohn uh, answered it very well. We, we do understand the challenges here. Um, and because of that, we will continue to work very diligently to try to have uh, solutions. We had to do what we're doing based on the data that we have in hand. Um, and so that's why uh, we are where we are. We think that at least there is a solution here for uh, the very large majority um, of immunocompromised individuals. And we believe that we'll probably um, have a solution for uh, the remainder in the in the not too distant future. Thank you, Dr. Marks, for those comments. Um, I'll ask uh, Dr. Cotton. Thank you. I'd like to express um, significant support for uh, having additional doses of the mRNA vaccine in immunocompromised patients. Over the past almost year and a half, I have taken care of many patients with life-threatening disease and including um, deadly disease and even after vaccination. And pretty much every week I have uh, known of patients who are immunocompromised and in the hospital. They did all the right things. Um, they're just uh, suffering from a lack of good vaccine protection. We know that vaccine efficacy is diminished in this population. And thanks to our colleagues in Canada and in France, we have good data showing um, improved vaccine um, immunogenicity. Um, it's somewhat unfortunate that we weren't, uh, because of the EUA, able to do such studies in the United States um, because it's very hard to muster a, a research response given the issues regarding a need for an IND. So I very much very much support this. And um, I also speak for um, my patients and many patient advocacy groups who also express tremendous support for this. So we're very appreciative both to the ACIP, CDC, and the FDA for doing that. Um, I do want to say that I uh, disagree somewhat with the equity um, decision and that there probably is not an impact on equity. I have definitely noted that many of my patients who have told me that they have gone out and gotten a third dose, um, not under a physician's guidance, but they have read websites, they have read the New England Journal of Medicine, they have read the New York Times, other, other places. And so because they are educated and savvy, they have gone out and figured out how to get themselves additional doses of vaccine. I have definitely noted a lack of equity, and I am really happy that the FDA and ACIP will be moving forward on this um, so that we can appropriately message, discuss, and provide um, additional doses of vaccine to people who may not be such self-advocates. Um, so I, I actually think that there will be a significant improvement in equity through what we are working on yesterday and today. Um, regarding the optimal lower age, um, I have also taken care of many pediatric uh, patients over the years, and in discussions with the pediatric um, oncology groups, uh, rheumatology, and um, transplant groups, they all supported a lower age. Um, so 
because the lowest age we have right now is 12, uh, we as a group would definitely support access to additional doses of vaccine for this vulnerable population, even understanding that there may be some enhanced risks in this population in general. We don't know that those risks exist in the immunocompromised population. And I'm hearing many devastating stories about young immunocompromised people being admitted to hospital with life-threatening disease. So um, if it were my child who were immunocompromised, I would uh, definitely try to get them an extra dose of vaccine if they were over the age of 12. Thank you. Thank you for this comment, Dr. Cotton. Um, uh, Dr. Long? Dr. Long, I see your hand raised. Would you like to make a comment or add to the discussion? I'm sorry, you're not hearing me. We hear you now. We hear you now. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I'm in I'm in the boonies in New Hampshire, in front of a gorgeous lake. So, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I'm certainly going to be in favor of this uh, intervention and. Uh, I uh, agree with everything that has been said. I would like to have to see if there's a, could be a little bit more of a discussion maybe from the work group members about um, the lower age. So because there's such a variability in responses to the vaccine in the relatively few groups and few numbers of cases that you've shown us, uh, I, it's not the, the severely immunocompromised who could really so greatly benefit from this. I'm not worried about them. I, I'm a little bit more concerned about potential harm for those younger children, 12 through 17, who have in fact uh, had a robust response to the first two doses and now would get a third dose potentially one month after their second dose and it just makes me think more of setting up for those individuals um, the potential uh, situation of myopericarditis or other uh, 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 immune or inflammatory responses. So uh, the, 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 the question is, especially for the younger group, have we ferreted out as best we can those that were are severely immunocompromised who would most certainly benefit and not just put up some uh, tag along groups like hemodialysis patients and like some other uh, immunocompromised individuals, especially HIV who don't have severe immunocompromised, just set them up for potential harm. Um, I did notice, Dr. Oliver, that you mentioned a few times that most of the work group agreed. I wonder if you could tell us about any dissenting opinions or any discussion about potential harm uh, in the 12 through 17 year olds. Thanks. Dr. Long, this is Amanda. I can start um, and just by reminding you that unfortunately, um, when the ACIP work group discussed um, this they only focused on 18 and above, which is why we have this specifically as a question number two for you all, because um, the ACIP work group uh, was, uh, was uh, we, we weren't aware of the what the age indication would be of this EUA, um, and so they focused on the adult population. Um, so I, I think that is um, the... Uh, Th there wasn't a discussion, and uh, Dr. Dooling can certainly talk about the dissension for the other topics, but I think given that you're focused on that age group, it may be nice to hear from other ACIP members um, about uh, maybe those who are on the work group uh, about that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this is Dr. Lee. I'm actually going to chime in because I am on the work group and also because of the, uh, you know, I'm on the vaccine safety work group, and I'm actually going to ask um, in the meantime while I'm talking for other ACIP workgroup members, uh, if you'd please raise your hand and contribute, this would be terrific. I'll just give my own opinion, which is that I think that um, uh, the age down to 12 is actually helpful from an equity and access standpoint, uh, in part because I, you know, we have, as clinicians, seen uh, immunocompromised children uh, who remain at risk uh, for uh, uh, contracting COVID infection. 
Um, and, you know, we're reopening schools. We're in this, uh, this whole other era where we're really trying to uh, support the safety of all of our patients as individuals and as well as um, and for the teen population in particular in schools. Um, what I would say is uh, just one other comment, uh, well, two other comments, one being that I do think the uh, the re sort of reactogenicity and then also potentially as a uh, sort of a version of that, potentially, you know, myocarditis, uh, pericarditis, uh, it, it, you know, it does from, in my mind, seem to somewhat correlate with immunogenicity. And I wonder if an, a, an impaired immune response is present, whether or not that risk is really modified uh, in individuals who uh, actually aren't responding. Um, so that, that's sort of one question. In addition, I think in my mind, the benefit risk balance when we're really talking about hospitalization and death, even for kids uh, because they're immunocompromised also sort of adds to that uh, benefit risk balance equation. Um, and then just a broad comment, uh, and then I'll call on my colleagues, uh, to state that it's a real challenge, I think, for us as clinicians who are also serving on ACIP, uh, because our duty as ACIP members is really to think about benefit risk balance for the population. Um, where it gets really tricky is with the immunocompromised population, because there's not a single definition that identifies people uh, who are, um, you know, for example, moderately immunocompromised. Um, so as an ACIP body, our responsibility is to uh, follow the uh, uh, regulatory authorities in terms of what we're allowed to do and also think about population. But I also encourage us as an ACIP body and as clinicians to really talk about patients and individuals, because I think as clinicians, we want to make sure that we are uh, helping our patients understand the benefit risk balance because it is very individualized and in immunocompromised patients. Um, and also that we're, um, you know, uh, trying to, as much as possible, make implementation feasible uh, uh, within the constraints that we're given. But, you know, from a clinical standpoint, we'd like to keep it simple, make sure that the people who need protection are protected, and then be able to offer that protection. So my hope is that we can get to that harmonized place in the very near term. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Talbot. Any comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you say, and I think the main question is, what about the rare adverse events like myocarditis when we're giving a third dose? There's very little data, and so I think that needs to be kept in mind when adding the 12 to 17-year-olds. I do think my only concern about adding a third dose for the immunocompromised is the impression that um, our immunocompromised population will then be safe. Um, I think the reality is they'll be safer, but still at an incredibly high risk for severe disease and death. Um, and so I think there needs to be a, a fair amount of counseling and education that goes into this effort. That a third dose will likely improve some of the immune responses, but we will still have a population at high risk. And we need to remind them of that. And we need to remind everyone that they spend any time with to be vaccinated to protect them. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Talbot. Um, any other comments or questions from ACIP workgroup members or the ACIP on this particular topic? Ms. McNally? Yes, Dr. Lee, I was hoping that we could hear from AAP on this issue. I'm also wondering if during the workgroup discussions, um, any pediatric cardiologists were part of those conversations. Thanks. Let me first turn it over to Dr. Dooling to answer the latter question. And then, I, fortunately, I see Dr. Maldonado and Dr. O'Leary from AAP and uh, PIDS are, have raised their hands, so we'll call on them next. Uh, hello. Um, pediatric cardiologists have uh, certainly been uh, integral to workgroup discussions when discussing the myocarditis, pericarditis issues, in fact, also presenting to ACIP. Um, and uh, for the context of uh, this specific discussion on third dose, there were no additional um, uh, cardiologist uh, subject matter experts brought in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dooling. Um, Dr. Maldonado. Yes, uh, thank you so much for letting me uh, make some comments here, and I'm going to be brief, but I um, absolutely agree that we need to provide uh, additional support 
for our individuals 12 to 18 at this point, I want to point out to all of you that Dr. Lee Beers, the president of the Academy, uh, our Academy of Pediatrics, uh, did provide a letter to an open letter to the FDA, really uh, under, uh, under, underscoring that issue that we really need to uh, focus um, on children under 12 as well. Um, and just reiterate that while there is justifiable concern about reported cases of myocarditis, these are again uh, extremely rare and um, uh, we know that the severity of the infections right now and the events that we've seen with vaccines have not uh, shown any evidence of adverse immunologic responses, either clinically or in laboratory studies. So um, these are, uh, high, at this point, um, important considerations, but if they would occur, would, would potentially be extremely rare, whereas we have heard and have seen uh, ourselves the impact of this particular disease on children overall and children, uh, especially who are immunocompromised. And we're concerned uh, about the safety of our children and the fact that they are still vulnerable, even healthy children, and especially are immunocompromised. So the Academy, I believe, and we have not had a formal discussion about this particular issue uh, because it has been so recent, but uh, the Academy stands behind um, any efforts to provide vaccines for children uh, when they are indicated, and I think that they are indicated in the older population in, in this uh, subgroup of immunocompromised, certainly would um, hold true for our pediatric uh, population and provides them additional options with, of course, with counseling from their providers and their subspecialty providers uh, around benefits and, and harms and potential risks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Dr. O'Leary? Yeah, and speaking both as a work group member and also the, the PIDS representative, Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, um, you know, I think that the, I want to speak in support of Dr. Paling, Dr. Lee, um, Dr. Maldonado, um, Dr. Cotton, everyone that has, has said, uh, spoken in support of uh, the 12 to 17 year old age group. Um, you know, in terms of the potential benefits and harms, you know, certainly myocarditis is, is a concern. I don't know that it applies any differently, though, to the 12 to 17 year old age group, age group than the uh, young adult age group for whom it's also a, a, a risk, albeit rare. So I think the discussions that we had in the work group do also still apply to this age group. Um, the only thing I would add um, is that I, I think because we don't have as much safety data as we would like in this population, you know, it's just it's a, it's a, a small group of individuals. I think uh, enhanced safety surveillance uh, would be great. I think uh, as part of the communication about this change in recommendation, really communicating to providers the importance of having um, their uh, vaccines or having their patients sign up for be safe when they get the vaccines, so that we can uh, have more robust data on the safety issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zahn? Uh, great. Thank, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, just speaking on behalf of local public health, I think uh, right now with the surge in Delta uh, cases that's happening around the country, there are a lot of settings where COVID is difficult to address, but there's really no setting that's more difficult than the school setting. Uh, we all, I think, are very committed to trying to get kids back in school and in-person learning but uh, those settings are just extremely challenging when there's a lot of COVID in the community and for in particular addressing the issue of you know, compromised children, those settings uh, is, is just an ongoing issue. And so I certainly uh, would echo the support of others for consideration of the 12 to 17 age group. Uh, certainly as Dr. Talbot and others have mentioned, uh, this, uh, there is still uh, going to be uh, ongoing risk for you know, compromised populations. So we still have to think about all the measures we have to other measures we have to do to keep them safe, but I really have to think that we have to take all reasonable measures uh, to attempt to uh, protect uh, kids who are 12 to 17, you know, who are immunocompromised. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we have run uh, way over with this excellent discussion. Um, uh, as a way to um, kind of close the loop on this issue, uh, I would, you know, perhaps like to request that uh, number one, that uh, number one, I just want to recognize that. 
we were under the impression that we were focused on adults as you know work group members. Um, I think the pediatric population is incredibly important. What I would say is over time, uh, we hope that with additional data uh, to support these discussions uh, that we can start to incorporate um, that in particular for the pediatric population um, uh, as, this, as this rolls out. So, okay, thank you very much. I think we'll move on to uh, Dr. Goswami. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Sanchez has something to add. Go ahead, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, Grace. Um, you know, I just also want to echo uh, what the others have said in support of additional doses of, of the messenger RNA vaccines. But I also want to um, agree with Dr. O'Leary and actually Dr. Long about the need for enhanced surveillance in the younger age group. I'm certainly in support of that, um, of, of the additional dose. Um, I know that we are not recommending, or at least it doesn't appear that we're recommending routine testing for antibodies. But I do think that um, that in the higher, I, I just wonder, not knowing the full pathogenesis of the myocarditis in the younger adults, whether um, some antibody testing um, may, be, may be warranted or at least suggested um, as we try to define what that risk is in, that, in those individuals. Um, because, and I know that we don't have a level of antibody that we know to be protective, but if they have responded to two doses, um, is it, and again, these individuals are seeking medical care. It's not, they're not, it's not that, so I just wonder whether, um, in some of these individuals, uh, maybe but uh, antibody testing also may be, a, may be um, at least an option, if not uh, um, a suggestion for, for, for performing. Thank you. Dr. Lee, if I could thank respond you. to that. Yes, thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Kathleen Dooling. So there are two primary reasons why uh, the uh, work group uh, agreed with not including an antibody test into uh, a current recommend or a proposed recommendation for third dose and immunocompromised. Um, the first, as uh, Dr. Sanchez points out, is that we do not have good information on correlates of protection. There are many different types of antibodies, binding antibody tests, neutralizing antibody tests, and um, the interpretation of which would be uh, extremely difficult on an individual level, uh, level certainly with variability from, from lab to lab in these tests. Uh, second reason is that, uh, again, uh, the com there, due to variability among commercial tests, there are actually uh, no tests that are FDA approved for, this, for the purpose of testing antibody levels post-vaccination. So once again, uh, interpretation of such would, um, would be very difficult and not particularly useful in a um, population uh, recommendation. And this is Dr. Khan. I, I just... Oh, go ahead. So with respect to that, um, in the studies, how, you know, obviously in the, in the various studies that were presented and have been published, um, there was antibody testing done. And, and in all honesty, I have not reviewed the, the actual um, testing that was performed, but there has to be some reliability in terms of the, uh, of the testing that was done. And, because this is where we're basing the data. So yes, many of the... Yeah, actually, um, oh, go ahead, Dr. Dooling. Okay. Uh, so yes, on the data presented, uh, we, we do rely on antibody testing uh, in various forms, binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. Um, usually studies uh, do a number of these to try to fully um, characterize the immune response. And uh, we, we do note uh, a, a limitation of the data that we presented is that um, uh, antibody measurement and thresholds do vary by by study protocol with that variability between assays that I mentioned. And this is Dr. Cohn. I just want to mention that um, we uh, hear all of your comments about enhanced surveillance, and we are absolutely implementing um, uh, uh, vSafe for uh, looking at a third dose and uh, really want persons to participate. 
um, but we'll also be um, looking for other ways to ensure that we are monitoring uh, the safety of third doses in this group uh, closely. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Goswami. For discussion of clinical considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and we very much appreciate the comments and, and healthy discussion going on with particularly so many moving parts. Today I'll be sharing with you proposed clinical considerations for use of an additional mRNA COVID-19 vaccine dose following a primary COVID-19 vaccine series for immunocompromised people. Next slide. Before we launch into the discussion about additional vaccine doses, we did want to respond to a request that was raised at the last ACIP workgroup meeting regarding COVID vaccines and pregnancy. We have posted language strengthening the recommendation for COVID vaccine among childbearing women and pregnant people earlier this week. In summary, COVID-19 vaccination is recommended for all people aged 12 years and older, including people who are pregnant, lactating, trying to get pregnant now, or might become pregnant in the future. It's important to note that CDC and ACIP have never pointed to pregnancy as a contraindication to COVID vaccine, but additional real-world evidence about the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy even further demonstrates the benefits of receiving a COVID-19 vaccine outweigh any known or potential risks. And this is particularly important as we are all well aware that COVID-19 itself increases the risk of both severe illness and pregnancy complications. So as of August 11th, last Wednesday, you can find this updated language at our considerations web link here um, at the bottom of this slide. COVID-19 vaccines do not cause infection in the pregnant person or the fetus as it is not a live virus vaccine. There are no safety signals we've seen in animal studies. We have reassuring early safety data on mRNA COVID-19 vaccines during pregnancy Early data suggest mRNA COVID-19 vaccines during pregnancy are effective, and there is no evidence that any of the COVID-19 vaccines affect current or future fertility. You can learn more about CDC's recommendation for COVID-19 vaccination in pregnancy at the CDC IDSA COVID-19 clinicians call scheduled for tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, and we've included that link at the bottom to register for that as well. Next slide. Moving along, we want to outline the process for the consideration of an additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people, which is being discussed today. As many of you know, the first step is data review to assess the safety, immunogenicity, and implementation features related to use of an additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine in this population, which Dr. Dooling just presented. Then there is regulatory allowance by FDA. At this point, FDA has issued an emergency use authorization or EUA amendment for both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna COVID-19 vaccine that allows ACIP to make recommendations under an EUA. Once there's regulatory allowance, CDC or ACIP can have a clinical update with clinical considerations or recommendations for use. This presentation will review the proposed interim clinical considerations for use of an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people. Next slide. To make sure we're all on the same page, it's important to keep in mind that there are two distinct potential ways an additional vaccine dose can be used. The first way an additional dose can be used is after, um, but in association with a primary vaccine series. Administration of this additional dose is needed when the initial immune response following a primary vaccine series is likely to be insufficient. Now contrast that with using an additional dose as a booster dose. This is a dose of vaccine administered when the initial sufficient immune response to a primary vaccine series is likely to have waned over time. We do wanna clarify right away that the need for and timing of a COVID-19 booster dose have not been established. And you'll hear more from Dr. Oliver on that in a bit. But for now, we're gonna focus on this first category. Next slide. Next slide. The focus of the proposed clinical considerations are as follows. For people with moderate to severe immune compromise due to a medical condition or immunosuppressive treatment, the potential to increase immune response coupled with an acceptable safety profile 
support consideration for an additional dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine following an initial two-dose primary mRNA COVID-19 vaccine series in this population. Next slide. So you've heard about some of the proposed categories for moderate and severe weak immunocompromised people. This is the proposed list uh, developed from a combination of resources, including the ACIP General Best Practice Guidelines for Immunization, CDC Yellow Book, and the 2013 IDSA Clinical Practice Guideline for Vaccination of the Immunocompromised Host that we would propose be listed on our CDC considerations page as follows. First, patients undergoing active treatment for solid tumor and hematologic malignancies. Patients who received a solid organ transplant and are taking immunosuppressive therapy. Patients who received chimeric antigen receptor T-cell or hematopoietic stem cell transplant within two years of transplantation are taking immunosuppressive therapy. Moderate or severe primary immunodeficiency. Advanced or untreated HIV infection. Active treatment with high-dose corticosteroids that is 20 milligrams or more of prednisone or equivalent per day, alkylating agents, antimetabolites, transplant-related immunosuppressive drugs, cancer chemotherapeutic agents classified as severely immunosuppressive, tumor necrosis factor blockers, and other biologic agents that are immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory. Next slide. There are chronic medical conditions that may be associated with varying degrees of immune deficit um, that was specifically raised during some of these comments, and the patient's clinical team is best able to assess the degree of altered immunocompetence and optimal timing of vaccination. Uh, with specific attention paid to current or planned immunosuppressive therapies. Whenever possible, mRNA COVID-19 vaccination doses, including the primary series and additional dose, should be given at least two weeks before initiation of immunosuppressive therapies. Factors to consider in assessing the general level of immune competence of patients with chronic diseases include disease severity, duration, clinical stability, complications, comorbidities, and any potentially immune suppressing treatment. We do want to highlight, as was discussed earlier, and is proposed wording we would put very clearly um, on our considerations page, that utility of serologic testing or cellular immune testing to assess immune response to vaccination and guide clinical care, such as in the need of assessing for need of an additional dose, has not been established and potentially would not be recommended at this time. Next page. Implementation considerations that additionally we would list. The additional dose should be the same mRNA vaccine as the primary series. Alternate mRNA product can be used if primary series product is not available. Until more data is available, the additional dose would be administered at least 28 days after completion of the initial primary series. Currently, there aren't data to support the use of an additional mRNA COVID-19 vaccine dose after a primary Janssen COVID-19 vaccine in immunocompromised people. Um, but we would uh, list on our site that FDA and CDC are actively working to provide guidance on this very important issue. Next slide. Um, in response to ACIP feedback, we very much would plan to emphasize the importance of infection prevention measures, recognizing this additional layer of protection. Here, immunocompromised people, including those who received an additional mRNA dose, should be counseled about their continued potential for reduced immune response to COVID-19 vaccination and their need to follow prevention measures, including wearing a mask, staying six feet apart from others they don't live with, and avoiding crowds and poorly ventilated indoor spaces until advised otherwise by their healthcare providers. Close contacts of immunocompromised people should also be strongly encouraged to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Next slide. We would plan to uh, put updates of CDC clinical resources regarding administration of the additional dose associated with the primary vaccine series for some immunocompromised patients um, that you'd be able to find at this web link. Next slide. Uh, with that, I'll close with acknowledgments to colleagues on our CDC COVID-19 response vaccine task force. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this presentation is now open for questions or comments. I'll take it from the ACIP members first, Dr. Long. 
Yes, um, uh, thanks very much. I, you introduced a new concept here that we had, I hadn't thought about in the initial recommendation. And that is one of your, you were talking about chronic medical conditions. So uh, the slide that had that on the top, chronic medical conditions, and then uh, about two points later, there was in parenthesis, to consider giving dose one, two, and three before immunocompromised. Now, that's a totally different situation in my opinion. And uh, for instance, if you're preparing someone for a transplant, the transplants being those that are most likely to uh, not respond adequately, I sure wouldn't want to do that. I, that's the one in which I'm with Dr. Sanchez. I want an antibody titer to tell me that someone needs a third because it's almost certain that for those transplants, it's after the beginning of the uh, anti-rejection uh, uh, medicine uh, that that patient becomes immunocompromised. So uh, what, what led you to think about giving three doses in preparation for immune compromise? Can you pull up that? Can you pull up the slide, please, that we're referring to? Sorry, Dr. Long, we're just, um, can, can, Dr. Lee, do you mind going to the next question? We're trying to figure out, we're trying to make sure that we address yes, that's that. That's it. Yes, this, this is the slide. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the third bullet. <laughs> um, I'll, how about we give you, uh, we go to Dr. Talbot, and then we'll come back to Dr. Long's question. Dr. Talbot? Yeah, I really thought this was well done. The only question that I have is timing of this third dose. Um, we have seen other countries have spaced out their first and second doses and have had improved immune responses. Um, and this makes sense immunologically. So I'm guessing I'm looking for some input or should we consider some clinical guidance on when to give this third dose? I would hate for someone to go three weeks after their last, after their second Pfizer and get another Pfizer. Um, because I don't think um, that they will get the optimal response from that third dose. We're not um, giving them the best chance to succeed. And so many of our previous vaccination time periods have been uh, day zero, one month, and six months. And so should we consider at least giving some time between the second and third dose to allow for the best immunologic responses in these patients and giving them a better shot at reaching um, levels that would be protective. Hi, Dr. Talbot, this is, oh, this is Dr. Oliver. I'm gonna take it because there was discussion going on <laughs> regarding the last question um, in the room. So um, the EUA was written for at least uh, 20 days or at least a month after the, the primary series. So that uh, is what was incorporated here. We're happy to hear kind of additional considerations, I think, Two things, though, that I will point out, some of these individuals, you know, have had time elapsed since when they got their primary series. Um, uh, individuals with underlying medical conditions, including immunosuppression, were some of the earlier phase of the vaccine rollout. So many of them will be several months beyond when they got their primary series. Um, the other thing to point out is if individuals have not responded to the first two and to say they had to wait at least six months could put, um, you know, a substantial time period between where they, we you know, are, are worried that they're not protected between when we could give the um, that additional dose. So that is why it was written the way it is, um, but happy to have conversation uh, around this and um, uh, potentially even input from Dr. Cotton, who uh, would would uh, be considered one of the, the global subject matter experts on this. Over. And before, and before Dr. Cotton speaks, maybe she can also speak to this point. My concern is if someone hasn't responded to two doses and their level of immunosuppression has not um, resolved, they likely won't respond to a third dose. I'm looking at those who've had a response, but not an adequate response. I think that was my thought. So I would love to hear Dr. Cotton's thoughts. Great. I call on Dr. Cotton to comment. Thanks. I think that this is a very heterogeneous population. You know, it's one thing if we're talking about organ transplant recipients who may be are getting further and further away from the time of their transplant, at which point we know based on all other vaccine studies that 
the immunologic response to vaccination improves over time versus if it's, say, a population that's getting rituximab, where we have seen greatly diminished um, serologic uh, response to COVID-19 and other vaccines. So I think it's a heterogeneous population. In the absence of data and with a, an intense worldwide pandemic, I would be sort of reluctant to make it zero one one in six months um, in that if somebody, say, had I've seen plenty of people who just finished their second vaccine. Would I actually make them wait another six months um, at this point? And, you know, based on the data by Kamar et al. from France or um, the data from um, Humar and um, Kumar in um, Toronto, I would be reluctant to have a long period of time before they undergo additional doses of vaccine. So I sort of agree with what the FDA had proposed it's possible that we may get to a point where they need not additional doses of vaccine, but actually booster doses. And thank you for providing that clarification in the talk. Um, but they may need booster doses six months or longer at some point further down the pipeline. Um, I have to say, I'm not always the biggest fan of these sort of rigid interval, unless there's for in intervals for vaccines, um, unless there's a strong body of data stating that, you know, zero, one in six months is a perfect answer. So I would, I would allow for flexibility, but I would, I would somehow have clinicians be thoughtful. And if people are just coming off a dose of like a course of high dose steroids, or if they've just been treated for rejection, or if there's some reason that they've had a significant augmentation in their overall immunosuppression, I would not necessarily have them get their additional dose right at that time because it's unlikely that the vaccine's really doing anything. So I would try to think hard about timing. Um, I'm not, um, and kind of changing paragraph, I'm not entirely um, convinced uh, that people need three doses um, before the initiation of immunosuppressive therapies. Although that may be true for some, you know, for example, the patients who have uh, kidney disease and on dialysis in whom we have um, noted, you know, mild to moderate immunosuppression, I would say, in the COVID-19 context. So maybe they could benefit, um, but I don't know that everyone heading into immunosuppression necessarily needs it. And one thing I don't want to encourage is delay of necessary immunosuppression to treat what can be dramatic autoimmune and other diseases needing immunosuppression. So somehow I tried to kind of think about clinical status and think about need for immunosuppression and those things as we sort of network in um, the vaccine recommendations. And it is, I appreciate that this is um, challenging. Hi, this is Dr. Kathleen Dooling. I'd like to respond to a few of those points. Um, first, uh, as, as you uh, highlight, Dr. Cotton, this is a highly heterogeneous uh, group with very complex medical needs um, that are going to vary by, by condition and by individual. So our attempt here was to make these clinical considerations um, a starting point that will definitely need to be adapted by the clinical care team treating these uh, individuals. So to, to start with point one, the 28 days, um, that is meant to be a minimum and absolutely needs to be adjusted based on the individual considerations of the treatment regimes uh, for an individual. So again, that's, that's just a starting point. As, as we know, the vast majority of uh, immunocompromised people who have received their primary series did it months ago. So um, again, we will have longer intervals. Uh, it should be noted that many of the studies that were presented uh, vac provided a third dose uh, at an interval that, that was uh, one or two to three months uh, beyond the completion of the initial primary series. Um, to move on then to uh, the, uh, the third bullet, which is whenever possible, uh, vaccination should be given at least two weeks before initiation of immunosuppressive therapies. That should also be uh, worked into uh, an adjusted 
uh, to the individual considerations of any given patient. Um, it is uh, a, a principle of a vaccination that whenever possible, vaccination should be given primary, uh, sorry, uh, prior to instituting uh, immunosuppressive therapy for maximal uh, protection from that vaccine. And I think that's the general point that we're trying to get at there. And perhaps it might be uh, improved if we say um, at least two weeks before initiation uh, or uh, resumption of immunosuppressive therapies, understanding that uh, many of these patients um, will have a fluctuating course of immunosuppression. So this is Amanda. We can um, we will take uh, these comments um, so far regarding these particular bullet points and uh, edit this language before we uh, put it out. Thank you, and we can review that uh, perhaps uh, uh, prior to the vote. Um, Dr. Cal Calvert, do you still have your hand up? No. Okay. Dr. Sanchez would like to respond. Go ahead, Dr. Sanchez. Yes. Thank you. I think. Dr. Long's point, though, is do some of these individuals, and getting back to the, the dosing before initiation of immunosuppressive therapies, um, is whether, I think that it depends certainly on the condition before initiation of immunosuppressive therapies, because some of them, I mean, with routine vaccination, we, we just give the routine vaccines at the appropriate dosing rather than additional dose, and whether some of those individuals actually need a third dose is my, I, I, what I would think, that some of them um, may just need the routine two, two doses before um, and not need a third dose. Dr. Sanchez, I think that the um, considerations, this is similar to um, recommendations around the additional dose the two-dose primary series for uh, men ACWY vaccines. I think this is almost to be considered like a primary series for persons who are immunocompromised rather than an additional dose. We used the word additional dose um, to try to um, not uh, uh, conf we thought it would be an easier way to address it, but I think um, that's sort of the approach that we were taking, um, that, that most people who were immunocompromised should um, would would the most number of people would respond after a third dose. Um, but we can certainly, I just want to remind everyone that we're not voting on this language. Um, we're um, just voting on whether to make the recommendation or not, but we can, um, I, I think this has been really helpful so far and we have some other people to speak, but the, the purpose here is to provide some different options or guidance for providers um, who are looking for guidance, but I think it's absolutely going to be uh, according to the individual provider and patient about the best course of action. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Um, I'm going to actually, we have three um, hands raised. I'm going to turn to those three hands, and I think we will um, conclude unless there are any burning issues that the uh, ACIP members would like to add or discuss. Uh, Dr. Kane. Mute myself. Uh, one of the concerns I have from a health equity standpoint is, is that currently right now, about 25%, at least in my locality in Indianapolis, Indiana, are using Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And although we're not going to make any recommendations related to this, if I'm having new people because of vaccine hesitancy in our African-American population, our Latino population, if I'm doing a big push for vaccination, and I have immunocompromised patients like sickle cell, HIV, uh, chronic renal failure, which is disproportionately higher here, should we now be recommending that they receive a messenger RNA vaccine instead of the Johnson & Johnson? Because I don't know how long it's gonna take and how many cases we're gonna have to see for the safetyness of using a Janssen vaccine. So what are we doing currently now for our providers when we have these patients in these settings in terms of what vaccinations we can recommend? That's my first point. Real quickly, my second point is since I've already received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, should we consider subsequently to start a new vaccination series with a messenger RNA vaccination in order to protect my patients. I'm going into the Delta variant. It's really contagious out there. 
Transmission is increasing greatly. I don't have the luxury to wait to get that protection in them four or five months from now. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Goldman to comment next. Hey, thank you, Dr. Lee. I'll be very brief. And I do want to touch on a little different approach to the equity piece. Now, first, I do support giving an additional dose. I don't know how beneficial it will be in some of these patients who are immunocompromised. But in the clinical considerations, my concern is the operationalization of it in how patients are going to get the vaccine uh, in the sense of, will they be required to prove they are immunocompromised? Will they be asked to provide a letter? Are people going to game the system who just want a third dose? I'm already seeing it with patients after the FDA's announcement calling my office, wanting me to write them a letter to justify that they need a third dose when they are not immunocompromised. So I'm concerned that if localities are, will require some type of proof and patients may not have access to physicians in the first place to even write letters that don't need to be written in the first place, that they're not going to get access to an additional dose that they may need. I don't know how to solve this problem, but I want to bring it to the committee's um, uh, attention that these kind of issues are going on at the ground level, and that could promote and uh, that could be a barrier to access to care uh, in how localities operationalize giving out a third or an additional dose for the immunocompromised and just to be cognizant of that. Over. Uh, thank you. Um, and I just want to just say out loud that we are uh, acknowledging and processing all these comments. I just want to make sure we get to all of them. And then if our CDC colleagues would like to respond, we'll give them an opportunity. Uh, Dr. Freihofer. Uh, Sandra Freihofer, uh, American Medical Association, speaking as a practicing physician. Thank you so much for, for this great discussion. I noticed a, a discrepancy between the population of immunocompromised people that was uh, part of Dr. Dooling's presentation on slide six and the list of uh, immunocompromised people on Dr. Goswani's um, presentation, also on slide six. And it was the, um, they didn't, um, Dr. Gaswani's list did not list patients with asplenia and chronic, chronic renal uh, disease. I did note that um, on slide seven, that uh, the second bullet uh, mentioned the, the value of, of, of clinical evaluation that the patient's clinical team is best able to assess the degree of altered immunocompetence. But I wanted to, with that, um, was that an omission on, by choice or was it just left off by accident? Uh, thank you. Actually, since this is a clarification question, uh, Dr. Dooling, um, would you be able to respond quickly? And then we can... Hi, this is Dr. Goswami. No, thanks for that question and the point of clarification. Um, it, it was not an uh, intentional um, point to, to make those discrepant. Um, it was just in the interest of um, emphasizing that um, chronic medical conditions, while you know initially listed, could be perceived as a big bucket. It's important to keep in mind that, of course, um, individual uh, patients need to be considered in terms of their level of immunocompetence. Um, and whether it be um, for you know a, a dialysis patient or whether it be for someone with asplenia, um, that was those are certainly two examples, and there are many, many more. Um, so, so as far as we're concerned, those are those are aligned, uh, and that, that was just probably a uh, um, a typo or a, a logistics issue. Thank you so much for the clarification. Thank you, Ms. Howell. Yes, thank you. Um, just a couple of questions and a comment. Uh, for the advanced or untreated HIV, I'm wondering if CD4 counts will be used similar to what's used on the adult immunization schedule for live vaccines, if that's how it will be defined. Um, and then looking at on this slide, bullet number four, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, practically implementing this and that could apply to a lot of people in a long-term care setting. And so I'm wondering if um, there were any consideration given for whether or not this EUA authorization then could just be for all long-term care residents 
And if their level of immune competence is similar to people who have immunocompromising conditions. And then just trying to think about practically implementing this. Um, I represent the Association of Immunization Managers and communicating this to the public as much as possible if there can be examples of chronic medical conditions so people are able to self-identify. It will be, you know, as we know in the past when we recommend vaccines for people with different conditions, it's, it's much more difficult to communicate that and, and people are going to have to self-identify. So we're going to have to be very clear in who is immunocompromised and who's not. And so if we're talking about chronic medical conditions, it would be helpful to have very specific examples that we can put out to the public. Thank, thanks thanks so much. This is Amanda. Do you mind if I respond, Dr. Lee? Go ahead, please. Okay, I think that um, we're recognizing now that that first bullet is probably confusing. We really, this EUA is intended to be for people with moderate to severe immunosuppression and not, um, not persons with chronic medical conditions for which there might be some mild associated immunosuppression. If you go back to the EUA, it is equivalent to immunosuppression after a solid organ transplant. And so um, I just want to clarify that the intent of our clinical considerations is to allow for some flexibility for providers to assess their uh, patients' immunosuppression, and um, individuals will need to kind of test to their immunosuppression in order to get vaccine. But this, the intent of this is to limit this to uh, individuals for which um, are considered under the EUA, EUA to be moderate or severe. And so, for example, would not include long-term care facility residents or persons with diabetes, um, uh, persons with uh, heart disease. Those types of chronic medical conditions are are not the intent here. And we can certainly revise this language to be more clear. Thank you. And, um, I, you know, I don't know if there's any other issues you'd like to address, but I just want to say uh, that this discussion um, is exactly what is helpful uh, to clarify and make sure that uh, there is clarity on both the recommendations and the clinical considerations. So I thank all of our ACIP members and our liaisons and ex officio members for contributing to this. Um, Dr. Cohn, is there anything else that your team would like to address? Hi, this is uh, Dr. Dooling. I'd like to respond to a couple of the great points that were raised, uh, those regarding um, whether or not uh, any kind of uh, medical sign-off on uh, immunocompromised eligibility will be required. Um, there is, this will uh, not require that. Um, this is a self-attesting. Um, we do not uh, anticipate, we are not recommending that uh, either prescriptions or a physician sign-off be necessary for individuals uh, to receive uh, an additional dose of mRNA if they're immunocompromised. Um, there were great points raised about uh, new patients presenting for primary series vaccination and how to weigh the options of uh, Janssen vaccine or mRNA vaccine. Um, I think at this point, both are authorized under emergency use uh, for immunocompromised persons, and uh, it will probably warrant a, a discussion between patient and vaccinator whether the one dose of Janssen versus uh, initial primary series followed by an additional dose dose of an mRNA vaccine uh, is the right choice. Um, so thank you for those great points. Thank you. And with that, um, I want to thank our presenters again. And I will ask that we will now recess until 5 after the hour for a short break, at which time we'll return to begin public comments. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>